In the spring of 2020, like many of you, I imagine, I went through the five stages of dealing with a crisis, the emerging pandemic. First stage, of course, was denial. I couldn't imagine that it was going to be nearly as bad as it turned out to be. Why does COVID have to be on the front page of my newspaper every single day? Can't they talk about anything else? Then, as things got worse, as more people died, I did start to realize how serious it was. Then came anger, bargaining, depression, and finally, like most of you, acceptance. Okay, this thing is actually happening. What are we going to do about it? Well, we wore masks. We social distanced. We postponed visiting the grandkids. We worked remotely when we could. We developed a vaccine, and we invented new ways of being a community. On my block, we all made ourselves aluminum foil-covered hats with fake antennas, and every Friday at 6 o'clock, we'd go out on the sidewalk to point and laugh and to remind ourselves we know how to have conversations in person with real people. We said, we got this. We can do this thing. Of course, it's two years later. COVID hasn't gone anywhere. It's still with us. But the changes we've made in our lives have made a difference. Meanwhile, another crisis has been forcing its way into our consciousness. It's one we've known about for decades, but chose to pretend that it wasn't really there. Until the summer of 2021 in America, when it became virtually completely and absolutely impossible for most humans to deny that the climate was going bonkers. Now, COVID and climate change share some features, of course. Both are challenging and disruptive. Both are historic crises of global significance. Both target the poorest and most vulnerable among us the hardest, and neither is going away anytime soon. Both of them, though, offer the opportunity for us to regain a sense of our shared humanity, to focus on the health and well-being of the people we love, and by extension, our community, our country, our fellow global citizens. COVID gave us the sense that we can make big changes in our lives when we need to. And like with COVID, Humanity's been going through these same five stages of dealing with the crisis of climate change, for years denying that it was real, angry at solutions that required enormous changes in our lives, bargaining with carbon trade-offs. Some are still angry, some are bargaining, many are depressed. And well, you know, it seems like we've got a lot to be depressed about. But are we depressed enough to change? Time and again, we've seen how crises can bring people together in just remarkable ways. But what are we going to do about climate change? A good place to start might be the buildings we all live and work in. By 2060, we'll have over 10 billion people on the planet Earth. As global population rises, urban areas are booming. That means more and more buildings are going up. By one estimate, we'll be adding another 2 trillion square feet of new building space by 2060, the equivalent of putting up another New York City every 35 days for 40 years. That's another New York, all five boroughs, every 35 days for four decades. When we talk about carbon emissions, we're usually thinking about some big global categories that cut across everything else, like manufacturing, transportation, energy. And when we're talking about buildings, we're usually thinking about the energy that they use, like for lighting or heat, not what they're made of. But those big categories are also about putting up 
buildings, about manufacturing materials, transporting them, putting them together into the shape of buildings. And the materials we make buildings out of today have a massive carbon footprint. Look around the room that you're sitting in right now. Look at the walls, the windows, if there are any. Look at the ceiling, the floors, the carpet, even the chairs that you're sitting in. Do you know where these things came from? Do you know their carbon footprint? When we ship a steel beam or a block of granite across an ocean, we send carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. When we make cement by heating limestone to 2200 degrees Fahrenheit, we send carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. When we produce steel in a blast furnace, we send tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Individually, global cement and steel production each contribute more carbon emissions annually than all of the energy used by all commercial buildings in the entire world. Together, they represent about 15% of global emissions, which means that just two materials are responsible for more carbon emissions than the agricultural sector and just a little bit less than global transportation, also at about 15%. Surprise, you haven't heard these numbers before? Well, that may be because they're generally hidden inside these emissions, inside global supply chains, not so easy to see and understand as gas-powered cars or coal-fired power plants on the front page of your newspaper. We are in the middle of the most massive building binge in human history. And if we keep making them the way we always have, buildings will be one of the ways we are destroying our capacity to live on this planet. So we need to consider what we build and what we build with. The thing is, buildings are an essential part of our everyday lives. For basic human survival, we need shelter like we need food and water. But a primary driver of climate change are the carbon emissions from the built environment. We're talking about buildings of all types, homes, offices, stores, factories, warehouses, and infrastructure that connects the supply chains that bring us everything we use and touch, from food to smartphones. There is no modern world without buildings and infrastructure. And there is no future where we magically get rid of the carbon emissions associated with making those things. We won't stop creating buildings. But we can pivot so that the buildings we live and work in are a big part of the solution and not just an existential threat. We have to solve this. And we know how. But we have to act fast and on a massive scale. To start with, architects, engineers, builders, developers, contractors, building owners can design and construct buildings that are smarter, lighter, and use materials with a far lower carbon footprint. They can use new tools, new databases, new technologies that allow them to see, to understand, to calculate, to compare, and to reduce the carbon footprint of new buildings. Decision makers, policy makers at all levels of, of business and government can design and construct policies that require and incentivize transparency, reporting, and action to reduce the carbon footprint of materials. Manufacturers of materials can publish environmental product declarations, third-party verified, scientifically valid declarations of the carbon footprint of the materials that they sell. We already know how to solve this problem. 
we already know how to transform the way that we make traditional building materials like steel and concrete so that they are responsible for far lower carbon emissions. And we can use transformative materials like earthen slabs, algae, bamboo, hemp, straw bales, other agricultural byproducts, biogenic materials that pull carbon out of the atmosphere during growth and store it in buildings. Did you know that there's such a thing as living concrete that literally eats carbon dioxide? Scientists and engineers at the University of Colorado have invented living concrete. Get a mold shaped like a concrete block, add some water, some sand and gravel, some nutrients, some gelatin, a special blue-green algae, stir the ingredients, come back in less than a day, and you'll have a green concrete block that uses a new form of biocement that stores carbon and it's ready to add to a wall or foundation. Do you remember back at the beginning of the pandemic where there was this craze for baking your own bread at home? Well, use that concrete block like a sourdough bread starter. <laughs> Cut it into 10 chunks. Add each chunk to a mold with water, sand, gravel, nutrients, gelatin. Come back in less than a day, and you'll have 10 green concrete blocks ready to add to a wall or foundation. Do all of these ideas or solutions sound just crazily impossible or ambitious? Well, guess what? Guess again. They're all real, and they're all available. Imagine what buildings can do for us. Imagine a multi-story office complex composed of massive wooden beams and columns and wall panels engineered from small diameter, fast-growing trees sourced from sustainable forests that store more and more carbon rather than less and less. Imagine homes built of straw bale modules, quickly constructed, so well insulated naturally that they, their heating bills are close to zero and that they actually store more carbon than is emitted in order to build, construct, and operate them. Imagine saving and improving buildings rather than throwing them away. Imagine preserving, transforming our heritage rather than destroying it. Imagine an 18,000-seat sports arena that uses 100% clean, renewable energy and is net zero carbon for the materials used to construct it, partly because they reused or recycled every tiny available bit of the previous key arena, now called Climate Pledge Arena at the Seattle Center, home of the Seattle Storm and the Seattle Kraken. Yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, all of these solutions, all these ideas, all these products, they already exist in some form, either as products on the market, ready to be incorporated into new buildings, or as products in development, almost ready to hit the market, or as lab-scale inventions that show great promise and can be scaled up. What's required? is the will to change. Investments to enable markets. Policies and decisions by decision makers and policy makers at all levels of government and business that require and inspire innovation. Buildings can enable us to partner with nature rather than oppose and exploit it and screw it up. We can live and work in beautiful, healthy buildings made of materials created by natural processes like photosynthesis, the same magic that grows trees and flowers, vegetables and moss and lichen and produces the oxygen we breathe in order to live. The next time you see a building being torn down, you should ask, was that demolition absolutely necessary? 
Was there no way to save and improve the building rather than trashing it? Those piles of debris, will they be recycled as part of a new building or just thrown away? The next time you see a new building going up, you should ask, did anybody care enough to calculate the amount of carbon dioxide required to, to move, to make, to transport that concrete, that steel, that insulation, that glass, that timber. We have to reuse and improve every possible existing building. Reuse materials rather than throwing them away. We have to use materials that store carbon rather than materials that emit it. We can use materials that help us thrive rather than materials that threaten to destroy our capacity to live on this planet. The natural role of buildings is to nurture and enhance our lives, not to threaten them. Buildings can protect us, heal us, comfort us, teach us, infuse our lives with beauty and community. Buildings can be life giving rather than life-threatening. They can enable us to solve this challenge of climate change with elegance and innovation. We're at a tipping point, if not past it. Our behavior, our decisions in the next few years are crucial if we're to limit the damage from climate change in the next century. So what are we going to do about climate change? As you leave this room that you're sitting in, I'd like you to be thinking about the built environment that surrounds you, that you live in and move through every day in an entirely different way. The next time someone tells you that the solution to climate change is recycling, switching to LED light bulbs, installing solar panels, buying an electric car, flying less, you should say, yes, but you forgot about buildings. The truth is, all of these individual actions, all of these individual decisions are essential, important, critical, but solving climate change requires large-scale, systemic, structural revolution in both human relations, human culture, and in materials. And at the very center of that revolution are buildings. Solving climate change is not as simple as wearing a mask and social distancing. It's more layered. We must demand as humans, as consumers, as parents, and children, and neighbors, and friends, and yes, as voters, that the buildings we live and work in are not made of materials that are helping to kill us. Demand that we reuse buildings and materials rather than throwing them away. Demand that buildings and infrastructure pivot from being an existential threat to an existential solution a solution that opens the way to regeneration, innovation, opportunity, the creation of a new economy that works for all. We can imagine buildings. We can imagine buildings that are both beautiful and functional, intimately connected with the natural world, rooted in a vision of justice and a thriving human community. Keep in mind that carbon is not our enemy. Carbon's not naturally poison or pollution. Too much carbon in the wrong places, that's a problem. When you think about it, all of us here now are carbon-based life forms. We're all part of this dance of carbon atoms that makes up life on our planet. We just need to learn how to be better dance partners. Thanks.